it just as clearly as I can see that we are staring down the barrel collectively of a set of circumstances, each of which independently would be a major change to our way of life, a, a life changing event. And certainly throughout history, they have been. But it is their confluence, which now greets us. Uh, and these three things I'm describing are the hyperinflationary scenario, where we've printed tons of dollars, but they're chasing too few goods. Uh, the global grains shortage, and now it's extending into proteins. We've got poultry shortages being reported in mainstream media, and beef won't be far behind. And then this progressively breaking down supply chain with the shipping situation just going from bad to worse. And in fact, the title of this video, Brace for Impact, those aren't my words. Those come from a shipping expert who's describing that all the supply chain interruptions we've already seen over the last year are nothing compared to what we're, what we're, what's now going to be caused by all of these continuing interruptions, which are uh, accelerating and heightening. So like I said, each of these independently is something uh, non-trivial, is something significant. But together, we really need to uh, discuss and prepare for what this means. And I know you know, I love this audience because you are smarter than I am, and you know all this is going on as well. But I went through my day today trying to get stuff done and interacting with people who don't know what's going on who are still waiting and hoping for the pandemic to be over and things to go back to normal. But we know that's not going to happen. Notwithstanding that, it, it's not healthy to spend my whole day with those people kind of pretending. And so part of the point of this conversation tonight is not to be alarmist, because like I said, we're already, we already know what's going on. We already see the shits plural, hitting the fan, pardon my French, but that's, there's no other way to describe where we are right now. Um, but it's to be with that reality, to, to have a conversation in a healthy way about what's actually happening right now and normalize it so that we can uh, better prepare for it, so that we can be more mentally agile, even while existing in a reality that other people just aren't ready for. And some people aren't even seeing. I had one person on my Telegram group today, which is at t.me slash farmer. Please join us. Say that He said, uh, you know, it seems like these headlines you're posting about poultry shortages and this and that. It's like some alternate weird reality because I just don't see it here in, in the city. And I wanted to, to remind folks that uh, this may be especially true in urban areas because people within logistics and supply chain companies and retail have been directed in many cases. I've got multiple reports of this from Walmart, from other major retailers, have been directed to prioritize uh, the shelves in urban areas over the rural uh, retail establishments. We, we don't really care about the people in the country. Just make sure the people in the cities have their optics maintained. Don't pop their bubble quite yet, because if you do, it's going to get even crazier, right? When, when people go crazy in the cities. This is not a new phenomenon. Right now I'm reading this book, The Great Chinese Famine, which is horrifying. It, it's just staggering to read about what happened back then. And I want to talk more about that some other time. But I will share right now that that was their policy as well. In The Great Famine, villagers, quote, villagers starved so that urban dwellers could live. Saving the cities at the expense of the villages became explicit policy during the Central Committee work uh, in August 1961 because the political ramifications of Beijing going hungry were worse than Wuhan or Sichuan. Se uh, so it, 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 it was sort of implicit at first, but like I said, by 61, when people were dying in mass, uh, they literally made that the official Communist Party. Make sure Beijing gets grains even if you guys all starve to death in the countryside. So it's not surprising that people in the cities still have the wool pulled over their, their eyes here. But um, notwithstanding, this is an important conversation, so let's have it. I'm Christian, and this is the Ice Age Farmer broadcast. And I want to first uh, talk about the shipping situation, where we saw that headline, Brace for Impact. The U.S. import demand is still rising, the container shortage is persisting, record port volumes have not alleviated this, 
And while the line of ships that's been waiting to dock off the west coast and the ports there is now less than 20, there's some progress in emptying the queue there. Um, it's still tremendous the amount of damage that's gone on and the backlog and the expense for actually securing container storage has only continued to increase. So uh, some of these analysts are saying things like, quote, you ain't seen nothing yet. And I, I just want to remember to frame these quotes by the reality that there are already shortages of many consumer goods, that we already have a complete shutdown of the semiconductor industry and anything that relies on that with car factories unable to produce cars because we can't get the chips. And those integrated circuits are in a lot of things. You already know this. You already know that this whole thing has been set up to falter. This is a generations long plan in the making of the depopulation agenda. And they've just pulled the rug out now. This is, that's, that's why I want to have this conversation so that we can really appreciate the gravity of where we are right now. The data shows that despite this deluge of inbound cargo, uh, the import demand is not abating. In fact, it's increasing. It's getting worse. Importers are trying to catch up. Market capacity is in most cases oversold. No realistic improvement is on the horizon. In fact, it looks like it's just going to get worse, leading to more significant disruptions. Again, when you disrupt the supply chain, everything downstream from it falters. We're talking about farmers who can't get parts for their tractors, which further fuels the uh, breakdown of the food supply. We're talking about, we've already seen warnings of gas shortages getting, uh, some people already are finding pumps empty and that's expected to get worse through the summer when they said about 30% of the gas supply won't be available. In other words, only two thirds of it will be. And that makes problems with the trucking. So again, it's a series of cascading failures and it may seem like this is a slow motion collapse, but in terms of economic cycles and, and really like societal changes, this is happening at light speed. All of this has really kicked off since beginning of 2020, right? With the, the pandemic. So it's actually, this is a collapse happening in light speed in social terms. Let's continue though. Here's another piece from American Shipper. Brace for a shipping tsunami. US importers are going to face even more extreme delays ahead as our container capacity is maxed out. Again, we just can't even get these containers upon which the entire globalized economy depends for shipping parts and goods and pieces of frozen food back and forth because that's the way the system has been built. Everything depends on this free flowing goods back and forth and that's not flowing freely right now. So the whole thing is collapsing. The number of container ships stuck at anchor off LA and Long Beach is now down to 20 from 30 a few months ago. Does this mean the capacity crunch is finally easing? No, absolutely not. Warned the VP of Global Ocean Freight Forwarder Flexport. It's not getting better, it's getting worse. What I'm seeing is unprecedented. It's a tsunami of freight. During May, everything is basically sold out. We had one client who needed something loaded in May. It was very urgent. He was willing to pay 15 grand for a container. And even then, I couldn't get it. We couldn't even get this done with someone willing to pay whatever it takes. You can't buy it. It's like the food. It's not even a matter of price anymore. It's just not there. We're hitting the wall. We're bottoming out. Now there is a deluge of more data indicating how rapidly the supply chain is collapsing downwind of this supply chain of this uh, shipping situation. But I now want to talk about inflation. The Bloomberg Commodity Spot Index has been rocketing up and continues to go nearly vertical throughout April. And uh, this is a reflection of almost, you know, a, a basket of commodities uh, rising up in prices. So when we're talking about commodities, clearly that's steel, which has ex been exploding in price, lumber, which is one that you probably have noticed as well if you've tried to build anything lately. Now, this is a problem. You really start to get the, the picture here. If we're not able to import things, then we'll need to build them. If we're not able to grow food, we'll need to build gardens and uh, structures for our animals. But if we can't get wood or steel, if we can't afford it or we can't get it, period, then we won't be able to stand up systems to be able to feed our communities. And that's why, again, the bottom line tonight is that we need to be building our systems that allow us to produce these goods now, now, while there's still something available. Let's come back to that. Now, people, uh, even food prices, of course, food prices are also rising. And that's the one thing I've been hearing the most from people. It's the most visible 
thing because you viscerally feel that pain when you go try and feed your family at the supermarket and you can barely walk out without something meaningful without paying a couple hundred dollars at this point. Um, it's for this reason, because people are becoming aware of it, that even the White House put out that message a few weeks ago saying, pay no attention to that inflation behind the curtain. This is a transitory thing. It's it's just a baseline effects because we had a shutdown last year. So naturally, it's going to look like price. No, it's not any of these things. The media, of course, ran with those excuses and printed, this is not a big deal. It's going to feel look like there's some inflation, but it's not real. It's just, you know, just nothing to see here, folks. Don't worry about it. The White House did actually mention in that memo that supply chain disruptions are are playing into these inflation things, but they make the case that this was all because of the pandemic and it's going back to normal already. And so this is, again, it's transitory. This inflation you're seeing, not a big deal. Don't Don't sweat it. But we just heard from the experts in the shipping industry, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. So this argument too is fallacious. Uh, and certainly the White House memo did not speak to the fact that we have printed more dollars than you can even shake a stick at just in the past year. It's it, it, this That is a, literally a vertical line in 2020. And you hear Biden saying we need even more stimulus because of that bad jobs report. So they are by design. It's a controlled demolition of all the systems that that feed and clothe and house most people. And it's being done. They're grinding us into the dirt. And we need to get off of their systems. So that's not being talked about at all. Now, I don't want to get too far into inflation because actually more and more people are talking about that. That's a good thing. If you are wanting to see some of the parallels behind what's going on now to Weimar, which I've previously said, this is a very Weimar-like hyperinflationary scenario. Um, I recommend you check out this video by George Gammon, Michael Burry warns of hyperinflation, where he puts side by side the charts and the data about how uh, the Weimar Republic printed a ton of money and it gave them basically a sugar high. Things felt good for a little while there. So long as the government could spend money it didn't have faster than the volume could fall, Germany had the war and life as usual. But then ultimately, it's not sustainable. Um, and uh, that's a, it's a helpful video to compare the history, just like I've done with solar cycles, like what happened during the Maunder minimum, so what can we expect to happen now? Yeah, it's the same sort of a thing. What happened when they printed more money than ever before? How did that play out for them? Well, we know it turned into the bucket, the wheelbarrows full of dollars. Here, it's going to be different. It'll be your digital dollars, and this digital currency won't be something you can spend anywhere. It will be used to guide your behavior. You can only spend that money on uh, plant-based foods, not on meat. You can only spend that money on, right? You get the idea. These are additional controls that are being implemented through, uh, it's not even a currency at this point. It's money at the slave store, the company store. Now I want to talk about the food situation. Although I've been talking about it a lot, it's just important to, um, to mix this into the equation of these other factors as well now. Because when I said in October of 2019, that the USDA was lying. I interviewed a top 1% producer who said they were lying. They were understating the losses and overstating the yields. And that at some and he said, there is a force that is trying to give the impression uh, at the USDA that everything was all right. Trying a force and energy working to keep people unaware of the severity of the situation, but that we were running below pipeline levels. In other words, we're burning through our food supply right now, and at some point there will be a day of reckoning. Without that information, farmers are unable to adjust their plantings. The market cannot act to ration supply. We've talked about this a lot. What happens when the U.S. and the world, indeed, runs out of grain was the question I asked back in October 2019. Well, now, sadly, I wish it weren't true, but now we do have the answer. Prices are going vertical. Food prices are exploding. The Bloomberg AgriSpot Index has uh, increased 87% just in the last m a couple months here. And, um, and food prices will then do the same. All of these things take time to percolate down. And in fact, for the past year, a lot of this has been absorbed by companies throughout the supply chain who were reticent to raise their prices. But now that everyone's talking about inflation... Now that it's, it's called inflation expectation, now that that has increased as well, then it really starts to become a snowball effect. It's a cascading thing where you say, well, gosh, I need to raise my prices so I can still make money here, so I can still conduct business profitably. 
But if I raise it 10%, that's only going to last me like a week since things are all, everybody else is raising their prices. So I might as well raise my prices 20% just to buy me a little bit of time before I piss off my customers even more. And so that action actually increases the velocity as well. So you can see it, it becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy, this relationship between inflation expectations and actual inflation. And that's what's happening right now as all the price increases are finally rolling out. Um, retailers, producers, everywhere along the way are finally raising their prices. That's happening now, even as we begin to appreciate everything that I was talking about in September of 2019, when I said, we're about to run out of grains here, what's going to happen? Well, now the big banks are starting to say, hmm, we're running out of food. Um, Deutsche Bank said that, um, was saying that this is going to cause social unrest. This is from Zero Hedge. Deutsche Bank, Jim Reed, noted this uh, Bloomberg Agricultural Spot Index had uh, increased 70% year over year and said that's more than it's ever gone up in a decade here. There's, it's uh, going to create remarkable geopolitical risk for riots and for wars. And that's what happens when food prices explode. If people can't afford to eat, they take to the streets. Of course, Deutsche Bank was only repeating the warning that was issued by Rabobank here in March when they said their when they released their biblical lean and mean report talking about how they you know they couched this whole thing in the story of Joseph where there were seven years of plenty and seven years of famine and they were saying yeah we're going into the famine now and this whole <laughs> this whole report talks about Pharaoh and Joseph's dream and Technicolor Dreamcoat language. So there's tongue in cheek because they're sitting there in their bank ivory tower where they're gonna be able to eat no matter what. But uh, what they're describing is that, yeah, food prices are exploding, and particularly for third world countries and countries that depend on imports from the breadbasket countries, they're, they're in a world of hurt right now. We see every day more and more steps. Russia, just a couple days ago, uh, put a new limit on the amount of wheat that they're willing to export. And as the bread, Ukraine, Russia, Brazil, Argentina also just increased the duties because Brazil is so hungry, they were starting to come for their grains, and Argentina said, whoa, no. So as these breadbasket countries, these major exporters, shut down that flow of food out to keep their own domestic population fed and prices under control, uh, the importers are, uh, you know, we, we heard actually, that the, one of the, the agricultural minister of Turkmenistan said, if you put a cap on how much you're willing to export to us, you are dooming us to starvation. This is not a word you hear frequently between diplomats, right? This, I mean, this this tells you that uh, that it, that it's a meaningful impact when the breadbasket countries stop their exports. In fact, it's exactly what was described by George Soros-funded John Podesta-run food chain reaction game back in 2015, where they foresaw a pandemic disrupting the supply chains and causing a global food crisis. Of course, the outcome that came out of that whole exercise, which was also run by Cargill, one of the world's biggest food companies, was a global carbon tax. And you can see where this whole thing is running. That's why I call it an engineered food shortage. So again, the reports I just mentioned from the banks talking about how we're now going into seven years of famine and the third world is going to be hurting and we're in intense geopolitical risk. All of that is based on now. And now flows from the crop losses and the fact that we were running uh, at below pipeline levels for the last two years, since 2019, as I covered it, right? I'm not making this up. And now what's happening is that just, it's the same thing. Just as we talked about the shipping, it's getting worse. You haven't even seen anything yet. The same thing is true with food production. Brazil had a terrible season with their soybeans, tremendous precipitative extremes, like that we would expect during a grand solar minimum that delayed the harvest of soybeans and meant that the safrana crop as they call it, was was very delayed. So delayed, in fact, that each week as they come out with their new crop progress numbers, it's just gone down stro straight straight downhill, from bad to worse. And Arlen Suderman here, here is saying, with their saffron crop failing as badly as it is, we're going to need to significantly have more corn coming out of the United States. That's the bottom line. We need more corn. Uh, he just says it's required. He doesn't say what happens if we don't get it. We need more acres or above trend yields. We need a ton of corn 
coming out of the U.S. this year and soybeans. It's required. Of course, Arlen is not going to say, or else the whole thing is going to come down, crashing down, right? Or else global trade and food prices are going to explode to the roof. Um, the problem, ladies and gentlemen, is that it's not shaping up to be a good season for the United States. We've got a tremendous drought going on. You can see reported here yesterday, nine of the 10 top U.S. corn states reported abnormal dryness or severe drought on 42% or more of acreage this week. These precipitative extremes are happening as well here. And in fact, we're currently in a cold spell in a lot of the Corn Belt, which is, it's not frosting, it's not frozen, but it's cold enough that it is affecting germination. And I've heard from a lot of producers who are saying, it's, it's, it's not looking good. Some, sometimes, especially the, the, the bigger producers who are under contract are required by those big ag companies, Monsanto, you know the players, Syngenta, they are required to, uh, by contract, to plant their crops when they're told to. And those orders went out, and so those seeds are in the ground, but now it's very cold, and now they're, they're planting into the dust, and so they know, they, they, they already know, and they're telling me, yields aren't going to be here this year. So even as we hear Arlen saying, we require a really good crop out of the U.S., for the whole global food situation to stay operational, I'm hearing it's not, it's, it's not going to happen. So I'm saying, just like the uh, shipping guy said, we're not even fully seeing the effects. We are not even in the food crisis yet. And already we're at record decadal highs for corn and soybeans. That's, we ain't seen nothing yet, to borrow his phraseology. So... Um, it's not just the global grains crisis. All of these things have been mounting. Today, reported in the mainstream media. In the mainstream media, we're hearing about meat shortages. Again, restaurants facing a nationwide chicken shortage. Family-owned restaurants around the U.S. are struggling to keep a steady supply of chicken tenders, wings, and breasts on their plates due to a nationwide poultry shortage. Oops, that was supposed to be before. That's about how large the drought is how bad the drought conditions are across many parts of the U.S. And this is about how bad the drought is in South America. It's so bad, not only has it affected the safrana crop, but the, the levels of the rivers have gone down, and they can't even float barges there to export their grains. So their yields were reduced, and even that that they did grow, they can't get out because, here you quote, barges are carrying less than their usual load. The situation is so desperate in Paraguay that the country is begging Brazil to please release some, some water so we, can get, so we can export our grains and feed the rest of the world. So it's just staggering. But back to the proteins. We have a chicken shortage. We're also expecting to see beef uh, run into shortages as well. Here's a message from national farmers who are saying, you can expect to see short supplies of beef at the counter. Our exports are collapsing down 28% week over week and down 18% versus the average because it's not there because we're running out of beef to export at this point. So we've already taken a look in the past at how our frozen protein shortages, frozen beef, frozen chicken have all dropped precipitously over the last year throughout the pandemic. So we've already eaten through that buffer. We no longer have that reserve to draw upon from our frozen meat stocks. So given this global grains shortage, given the protein shortages. Uh, of course, the, um, the establishment is starting to really ratchet up their rhetoric around, well, we might need to go ahead and have GMOs. Now, you're just, you're just going to have to do it. You're going to have to accept GMO now that we've got global warming. That's the, that's the carte blanche for everything because Club of Rome says it's a climate emergency. So Bloomberg, the cure for our food shortages... And this is really, this is the seismic change that's happening right now, is that the media, and this is how you know we're at that demarcation point, we're going to start feeling the food shortages now, because they've started putting in place the scripting to, to suggest to you the solutions. This is the problem, reaction, solution, Hegelian dialectic, that I know you under, I know you know this by heart by now. You've, you've heard it so many times. We've, <laughs> we've, they've played it so many times, tried and tested. But when you see Bloomberg saying, well, now that we got these food shortages, you're going to have to eat GMO. It was the same argument that we heard from the uh, CEO of 
the bio barcode company Anika that I mentioned in my previous report, he said, well, consumers are just going to have to change their behavior because climate change. We're, we're, you're not going to be able to eat unless you eat GMO. So this this is their excuse. This is their wedge to uh, to force a change in diet. That's, I mean, that's exactly what the Eat Lancet Commission told us they were going to do, is force a complete fundamental transformation of our food supply because of climate change. Uh, and indeed, it's happening. All of those, all of their stated goals, get off animal agriculture, end meat and dairy. We're seeing the scripting being laid here right now from Food Processing Magazine. Cultured meat is growing in popularity. Doesn't matter if you call it lab-grown or cultured or cell-based. They're becoming more popular. Yeah, sure they are. We're running out of meat. That's what's happening. And that's why companies like Nestle, the biggest food company in the world, is now rolling out their new plant-based meat, uh, meat, milk rather. Nestle is jumping into the alternative milks arena, coming out with a product made from yellow peas to be sold in Europe. The product was created in just six months. That's much longer than it took for the vaccine, at least. But, uh, but they're rushing to market with plant-based and lab-grown meat and dairy because they know we're, we're, we're there. We're at that demarcation point. But it's not just the synthetic lab-grown, engineered, and even plant-based sort of a stepping stone on the way there of food that's being rolled out. There's another narrative, and this one is even more telling. This is uh, something from SCMP. China food security. This food crisis is actually more of a livestock feed challenge. China is not producing enough feed grains like soybeans to support the livestock industry, and that's why it's relying on imports and sucking out the substance of Brazil and the U.S. for that matter, and from everywhere in the world that they're able to import. The deficit is, here we go, driving concern about food security, and it's really complicated. Oh, now we see that the reason we're running out of food is because of animals, right? Now we see the real excuse to end animal agriculture. We've heard Bill Gates talk about why we should, that we should all be eating lab-grown meat, We've heard the mission statement from Impossible Foods, which he funds, which is end animal agriculture. But it's just not working. People even save the earth from climate change. People just don't care. We've seen the latest statistics even for Gen Z. It says 70% of them don't want to eat lab-grown meat. So it's not going to work unless they engineer food shortages and blame the animals. And they're doing it now. This is a new narrative that we've not seen yet. Turns out, According to the mainstream media, we are competing with our animals for food. And if we have food shortages, it's their fault. And we're going to have to do away with animal agriculture. We just can't do it. We don't have enough food to feed them. They're dirty and dangerous and pandemic ridden anyway. But, but now they're competing with you for us to be able to feed you. So we're going to have to do away with it. And this is not unique to China. Here's Bloomberg just a couple days ago. Look at this headline. Feeding chickens is so costly that it's changing global trade flows. Some feed makers in the U.S. and China are now changing to wheat. We've talked about how they're reformulating their animal feed, trying to move away from corn and soybeans and using wheat. But wheat prices are on the rise. That's why Russia just stopped their exports. And, and um, feeding the world's chickens, pigs and cows has gotten so expensive, it's upending global trade flows. Please pay attention to the narrative that's being constructed in real time right now before our eyes. It's because of livestock. It's because of animal agriculture that we're having a food crisis. And even this, this even uh, intimates that the whole supply chain might be affected because we're, tr we're too busy trying to feed China's animals. This is a stunning shifting of the blame to try and pin animals as the reason that everything is hitting the fan right now. As grain prices surge, American chicken giant Purdue has taken the rare steps of buying soybeans from Brazil. This has also happened just a, a week ago. The U.S. is now importing soybeans from Brazil. We're one of the biggest producers in the world. Why are we exporting all of our soybeans to China, but then being forced to buy them from Brazil? Yeah, we're, we're not making sense here. We're not, there's no good leadership here. But these tactics highlight how tight the global market has become. Grain prices at an eight-year high. The cost of feeding animals and higher meat prices will be coming for animals. But um, this, this article, you know, uh, uh, 
Links to everything are below, and I would encourage you to read this article because it's very telling of that they are creating this argument that now there's a food crisis and it's because of the animals. It's because we can't feed them and you. And so we'll have to grow the meat in a lab and end animal agriculture, and then we'll have enough grains again. Everything, everything, it's always the promise. Everything will go back to normal if we get rid of animal agriculture. So they're going to make people feel the pain. They're going to have food prices rise, food shortages, meat shortages. Meat shortages is already happening. And they're blaming animal agriculture and promising that well, things will go back to normal if you just eat Bill Gates' meat, if you just eat the lab meat. Aren't you impressed by the celebrity steaks? Don't you want to try the cell-cultured, uh, human-cultured cheek meat where you can take a scraping off your cheek and then put it in a vat of <laughs> cell-cultured? It's amazing. But all of these things, they, uh, these disgusting um, things that defile God's creation, now they're saying we have to move to that. We can't do things the way we have been anymore. Traditional farming and ranching is done. Because of the crisis, look at this, it's a, it's a crisis. We're running out of grains and it's because of animals. So this is a really critical concept and I hope I've done justice to it. Perhaps I should have said this at the beginning of the video. Um, and it's working. It's working. We've already seen that uh, the size of herds, not just in the US, around the world is decreasing. Here in the US, more downsizing for the beef herd is likely in 2021. Beef Feedlot placements are way down. They're just not calving as much as they were in the past. And so, just like the shipping and just with the grains, there will be even fewer cows next year because the, the herd is downsizing here in the U.S. The same is true here in the U.K. from FarmersWeekly.uk. Cow numbers are incredibly tight with DEFRA, their U.K. version of the FDA, the same people that admitted they were walking around gassing people's chickens. I'm still mad about that. Uh, DEFRA is showing that the national herd is now at its lowest since 1910. Think about that. The UK has less cows than they have in over 100 years. They're ending animal agriculture. From Bloomberg, again, sorry, steak lovers, Australia is running out of cows. Russia also now, seeing the strongest poultry production decline in a decade. Just in the first two months of 21, Russian poultry production dropped 6.2% year over year. 6% drop in chicken production and eggs. So we can see that it's working, that the meat industry is being forcibly shut down. And that moreover, now, now we're at that point, that line of demarcation, like I said, where they're telling you there's a food crisis and worse yet they're blaming animal agriculture and preparing to shut it down completely because we had to we had to or we couldn't be able to feed you and the animals so where are we because i i think we've painted a pretty uh, complete picture even though there's so much more we could talk about on any of these three topics and certainly on <laughs> the race war that's being engineered, ginned up by the media and by the government. And of course, we could even get into the fact that we're now looking at people, you know, massive number of people injected with experimental injections. And, uh, you know, who knows how that will actually start to manifest over the next year. But even just taking into consideration, because it's enough, the three things I've talked about tonight, the shipping, right? The shipping crisis and the supply chain breaking down, which is a cascading situation. The inflation, which is another cascading and accelerating situation. And the food shortages. All of these um, are conspiring to create a situation where, you know, if it was just one of them, you could maybe be creative and uh, figure out a way to feed your family and stand up new ways to, to, to uh, grow food and raise animals and be there for your community or switch to a local, a more local economy. But together, if there's no supplies and there's no food and there's no currency, it's a, it's a, like I said, it's a really dangerous situation. And my advice to you, as I've been saying for weeks now, remains, you cannot remain a consumer. You cannot be a consumer in that environment because there's nothing to consume and there's no money to buy it with. You have to be a producer. 
And just as for years I have been saying, you must grow your own food, we're heading into engineered food shortages, and the, sh the answer to that, the answer to a failure of a centralized food system is for you to grow your own food, is a decentralized food system where we all grow. I want to now apply this same logic to everything, to all the problems we just enumerated, to everything in the supply chain that you get that's now failing. So if that's lumber, right, prices are through the roof. I went yesterday because I'm frantically building as much as I can here, and I'll talk more about this in a second. I'm building things that will allow me to, to be able to provide others around me, my neighbors, my larger community, with what they will need to stand up their food systems in the future, beyond seeds, right? If you have a lumber mill, then when lumber prices, uh, if you have a wood mill, then even as lumber prices continue to explode, and even if there are shortages, well, it doesn't it doesn't affect you at that point because you can go out and fell some trees and chop those things up, and then you'll be able to equip your neighbors with wood so that they can build a new chicken coop, so that they can build a raised bed garden and start producing their own food. If we're talking about uh, with with metals, if you've got a machine shop or a CNC machine, then that means that you're able to to create parts and uh, components where we're not able to get them anymore. If you've got a 3D printer, that's another sort of example. Stock up on resin. I know there's plastic shortages because of the shutdown plastic uh, facilities after Texas's grid went down, but um, stock up on resin if you can get it, and then you'll be able to print 3D parts that you need, 3D print parts that you need to uh, to create infrastructure, again, to, 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 to enable your community to continue to exist through this crunch time. Looking at housing, we know that the housing prices are going through the roof and that there's no, because of lumber chiefly, but there's, there's also a shortage of other parts that are needed. Um, if you're able to build tiny homes or you have an RV, well, this means you can provide housing for other people. So, uh, and I wanted to mention some of these other alternative construction techniques like earth bag construction, which is incredibly resilient. It's worth looking at even, even if we did have lumber, it's, 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 it's got merit alone. But particularly given lumber prices exploding to the roof, earth bag construction or aircrete or hempcrete, which I just learned about yesterday. I can't believe I didn't know about that one. Um, these are ways that you, should, that you should familiarize yourself with because we need the ability to construct sheltering for our families, for our communities, even as lumber is not, even if lumber is not accessible. So those are some examples, wood, housing, uh, parts, replacement parts and, and stuff like that, uh, where you become the producer of these things. Uh, education, just, just to take a non-commodity example, the schools, well, the schools have been screwed forever, but you need to get the materials you need now the curriculum, the textbooks, the history books, whatever it is, um, and look at methods like Waldorf and the, the quadrivium and trivium so that you know how to raise children with some understanding, some critical, some ability to think critically about the agendas that are being perpetrated upon us. We don't want to raise sheeple, and that, that takes work. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, being a parent is hard, and so whatever you need to equip yourself right now, do it. Do it. Get those materials now. But again, the bottom line here is that you must shift your whole mindset. You can, if we're not going to be able to buy stuff from a, from a breaking system, then we have to produce it ourselves. And then I want to amplify that because you and I are having this conversation. As I said at the very beginning of the video, a lot of people are walking around waiting for things to go back to normal. And it's just not going to happen. At some point, they'll figure that out. And when they do then they will need, they will realize that they need to start producing their own food and all this other stuff we're talking about. And that's why you and I, who are, I guess, early would be one way to, to say it. And certainly it feels late in the game already, but to the extent that we're having this conversation and, and they're not yet, we need to be positioning ourselves to be a producer of things that will enable them to also become producers, right? We're the early adopters. And so that's why I say a wood mill or other things, certainly stocking up on seeds, those are the kinds of ideas. And I'd love to, I'd love to hear from you on more so that as your neighbors and larger community 
figure out, holy crap, I've got to be growing food. There's none on the shelves or I can't afford it or, you know, whatever it looks like when they come to that realization. So that we're there with those seeds. Here you go. I've got buckets of this stuff. It's sorghum. It grows really well here. It's already adapted for our neighborhood. Take it. I'd, I would love for you to take it. I'm already handing this stuff out for free because anyone around me that's growing food is fantastic. That's a, that's a huge win for me. I, I would love to see more people growing. So I stand ready to equip my neighbors with all these seeds so that they can join me in growing as soon as they realize the value in it and apply that same logic, just like we did before, apply that same logic from food, but to everything. Try and gain the ability yourself now to empower more people soon. So that's both the, the central tenet that I want to communicate here. You need to move from consumer to producer if you've not done so already. And then even more over, you want to be able to produce things that allow you to turn everyone around you into producers too, so that they're not all coming to you in the future. So that is a, a, a look at this, you know, and I, it, I've struggled with how to deliver this message because it is a dark future. These are dark days ahead of us. And I don't want to think about that. And I don't want to get up here and act alarmist. And I, I don't think I am tonight. I think the data itself is alarming. I think what we're entering into, a generations long planned depopulation agenda and collapse is, you know, being on the precipice of that is an alarming situation, but we don't need to freak out about it. In fact, we, we can't afford to, we need to be calm and collected and cool as we stand up these new systems to empower ourselves and our communities around us. So once again, Look, we're all in this together. You and I see what's going on. And I, again, welcome your thoughts on, on how we can best weather this storm and also how we can make sure that as we do so, we don't uh, come out on the other end of it enslaved by the new technocratic system. Because that's the, <laughs> the other thing we have to do is get these people out of power before they continue to perpetrate their agendas, before they come and take away the animals that we're trying to raise right now, before they come in and um, confiscate the food that we're growing and the uh, 3D printed parts that we're creating. Because of course they're going to want to do that because they don't want you to make this shift. They want you to depend on them and be a slave in their beast system. I think we've said enough tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you do have ideas, again, I welcome them. You can reach me, iceagefarmer at protonmail.com. I cannot possibly respond to all of the messages that I receive, but I promise you I read them all and I thank you for them. And I will also invite you again to check out the Telegram group. That's t.me slash Ice Age Farmer. I've recently posted a, a, a thread just saying, hey, what are you what are you stocking up on? I asked the same question to my Telegram group. What are you stocking up on beyond food? As the supply chain is breaking down, you know, what what can you think of? And there are over 400 responses well thought out for the most part people saying hey here's something that uh, that's not on the generic like prepper stockpile list you know if if though if you're totally new to this whole idea there is a great list from james wesley rawls i'll put a link to it below it's called the list of lists and it's sort of just like a prepper centric survivalist uh you know all kinds of twine and it's just it's it's literally a a series of tabs in a spreadsheet that exhaustively thinks through uh, supplies that would be handy to have. And if you can still get them now, do it. But, um, but even more broadly, given all of the things we just talked about, I'd love to hear from you. And so check out that thread and come check us out in, in Telegram. There's, there's, there's even more information on my Telegram group that I could possibly fit into these YouTube broadcasts. So that's part of the reason I value that group and I enjoy being connected to you there. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching this tonight. I know it was a lot to digest, but we got to have this conversation if we expect to uh, to deal with the situation in a meaningful way. So thanks for having it with me. You can find this report and all my reports on iceagefarmer.com. If you're watching this on YouTube, I highly recommend you exit the platform. Come find me on bitshoot.com slash iceagefarmer 
or odyssey.com slash at Ice Age Farmer. Um, those are some alternate platforms where censorship is not as likely. And, uh, and again, on Telegram, t.me slash Ice Age Farmer. If you appreciate this broadcast and value the information that I'm bringing, Please help me keep it running. There's a few ways to do that listed at iceagefarmer.com slash support. And I very genuinely appreciate that support. I could not do this broadcast without you. So thank you. Folks, 